some of you may or may not know, but they're all here. Um, and today we're going to talk about uh, middleware integration platforms and uh, in that space in general. And to the right of me, we have um, quite a few experts uh, that have done uh, some 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 very large uh, projects and visible projects uh, across the public sector, uh, both at the state and local side and all the way up to the federal side. Um, and if you want to go ahead and introduce uh, yourselves, we have John Richardson Hi, with Savvy Consulting. Uh, as Joel said, I'm with uh, Savvy Consulting, the Vice President of Advanced Technologies, which I think is our company. Um, our company grew out of the uh, commercial sector uh, back in uh, early 2005. Uh, we're a group of us that came out of the commercial software environments and the DOD uh, kind of came together and said, hey, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's going on out there with regards to uh, commercial application of commercial technologies and standards that needs to be brought to the, to the DOD. And it needs to be done now and it needs to be done quickly. So uh, at that time, there was this thing called net centricity that was out there, you know, kind of nebulous and floating around and no one really knew what it was. So uh, we started taking a stab at, hey, what does that mean in defining that working with folks like Verdisa uh, and some of the uh, bleeding edge technology folks at DARPA and R NRO and uh, really starting to analyze what that means and what does that mean to tactical platforms. So our background and what our company does right now is exactly what, what I just said. We're are applying these commercial technologies to tactical platforms that are out there. And uh, these are platforms that are out there where our war fighters are, uh, where the rubber meets the road. So uh, that's kind of what we're doing right now. Yeah, and, John, and John's done some unique consulting engagements with Red Hat, actually. I don't know if we can talk about that at all. But uh, yeah, one of the practices that we have is helping uh, programs, PEOs, actually develop a community and kind of be the Red Hat inside of their own community. and. Uh, we we did that for the first time uh, last year with John, and it's it's gone it's gone pretty well to help the uh, the, the Navair customer kind of become this Red Hat centric inside their own. Uh, that's actually a, that's a great point. We're we're in the process now of taking you know the whole open source environment, the whole you know DoD uh, military open source paradigm that's starting to stand up out there, and really applying that at the program office level for program acquisition strategies and how the um, acquisition strategists at the program office levels can start using these open source environments and open source tenants to bring together a best of breed solution for you know, platform integration and platform development. Um, we, I, we don't really call it open source or military open source. In fact, we've coined the phrase inner source, um, which is an industry term somewhat loosely defined. Um, it's basically taking the open source tenants and applying them to a more uh, confined set of open environments, right? And eventually we'll start using those uh, features that are available to us out there for voice.mil insertion and, and distribution of the, the source code and the products that we're making. Yeah, and, and I've been here about 11 years and we've noticed that about 90, 80, 90% 90 of our customers you know, they do a very good job of consuming open source. But John, I think I would put in one of the 10% categories that actually is learning how to contribute, build communities around that themselves. So um, interesting stories there. To the right of John, we have uh, Mike Jacoby, Western Regional Director for Accenture Software. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, as um, Joel said, I am uh, Mike Jacoby. I am the Western Region Director for Accenture. Uh, so my responsibilities are a little bit mixed in that I have both uh, state and local government as well as well as federal responsibilities. In Denver, we have the Department of Interior and uh, Bureau of Land Management. And as you can imagine, with all the gas and oil exploration that goes on in the West, we uh, we, we do quite a bit of work with the uh, national lands that are out there. So um, we uh, uh, my responsibilities include delivering solutions to both state and local as well as fed government and one of the things i'm going to talk about today is a product because there we have started a five years ago we actually started a software group within accenture and it's called accenture software and we started with that product called accenture public service platform and we were a very early adopter of of uh, uh, open source technology specifically red hat and we've done quite a bit of work together jointly uh, over five years worth uh, where we have actually built out uh, compatibility and integration between 
their products like BRMS and JBoss so that we can actually deliver solutions to our clients using the business rules that we deliver with our COTS Accenture Public Service platform to our clients so that out of the box they can do things like uh, presumptive eligibility determination, um, document management, those types of things, security. So um, that's about it. Okay. To the right of Mike, we have Wael Ali, President and CEO of Spin Systems. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Wael Ali. Um, I'm one of the founders and uh, president of uh, Spin System. Uh, it's a small uh, engineering firm in, uh, in Virginia here. Uh, we do have our own products and we have our own professional services. Uh, we started back in the late 90s, just like a lot of other companies that wanted to be a dot com, you know, give out uh, web services and, and solutions like mail, web hosting, e commerce. But soon enough, we realized that this is really not the right business to be in. So we went back and refocused on being engineers and building our own solutions and products. Um, our decision was really straightforward. We, we really love uh, the open source uh, community and all the different products out there like JBoss, Apache, and what have you. So over the years, uh, we were able to adopt a lot of those open source uh, platforms and add our own solutions on top of it. And over the years, evolved into our own products uh, and their professional services. And we were able, uh, you know, by leveraging our own products and expertise to land our own, uh, uh, I guess, largest uh, contract with us for us, for our side, with the Air Force about 2002. And since then, we've been involved in the healthcare arena, uh, helping the Air Force, you know, collect data in near real time. And I'll go into more details how we were able to accomplish that and all the different challenges and hurdles that uh, we had to do. They were using JBoss before we bought them. I yeah, think, right? we started JBoss in 2002 before it was before it got bought by by Red Hat. Yeah. So it's like the open uh, source community. So even though it wasn't even on the distal list at the time, so we had to run it only in our dev environment and into our test environment just to show the government how powerful this thing can be, because our background was building financial solutions, uh, scalable, secure solutions using JBoss. And we figured if we can do this in the financial market, why can't we do it in the health arena market? You know, looking for, you know, collecting data in near real time, acting on the data, and you know, build BIs on top of it. So why couldn't we just leverage the same fin financial model into the health model? And we were very successful. So the um, I'm not sure if it's made it into the brochure there, but just to set the stage on the type of questions that we're going to ask here, um, just some of the research that we've done. Uh, the system integration market, just so everybody's on the same page, is about a $340 plus billion dollar market uh, by 2017. So it's a very uh, relevant topic these days. Uh, and it's primarily driven by the, the complexity of IT infrastructure and the silos that we create while we're going through the legacy um, uh, contracts from the past. So the questions will be centered um, you know, around enterprise application software, around modernizing your IT infrastructure to eliminate application silos through the consolidation and integration of IT infrastructure. Number two, extend legacy systems as web services and integrate with native web services through SOA. Number three, Fed-specific application integration use cases, and you'll hear probably a use case, I, I would think, from each one of these guys. And then the role open source can play. So the, the questions that I'm going to ask are going to be centered around that. If you have questions or uh, you want further follow-up, just raise your hand and we can get you to probably take a mic right so the questions get answered. Okay, no questions. Okay, no mic. So if you have a qu you have a question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, my focus obviously is within the within the DoD on the Navy side of that aspect, but I, I am very familiar with the, the organization that you're talking about and the, that project. Um, something similar within that same project scope is taking place within the Navy. It's called the Navy Tactical Cloud Environment, right? So, and basically, that is really taking that so a fabric that's being that has been developed and been utilized that. And you know various uh, little camps, if you will, across the entire Navy, and bringing that all together 
and building cloud infrastructure to connect them all together, right? Um, so that movement there, it, it, although that's really strategically based at the, on the ground level, right? Uh, Shore-based approaches, these, these, uh, a float community is also integrating that into their float uh, strategies as well. And what that means is that it extends from not just the sh ship to shore, but also to the air to the ground, right? So our tactical units in the air, both from maritime, meaning the pointing end guys, right? They're all getting their information in near real time via these network spaces that are being put up. So you had those traditional network spaces like Link 16, Link 11, you know, um, that were very closed network spaces and very little information sharing, very, unless you were actually, you know, taking a feed off of something like Geeks or Geeks M, right? Um, and what happens there is now we're really beginning to be able to uh, federate that information in a much more con uh, continuous environment, right? So it allows us to uh, have full reach back into not just where the data originated from, but all of the metadata associated with that that expands to the other 500 or so databases that contain information about that aspect. Well, from, from our particular platform uh, environment, what we're trying to do is we're trying to ensure that we have an open architecture, and that's a bad term these days, I know, it's, but uh, we're trying to ensure that we're following all of our open architecture principles. And along those lines, we're developing a uh, on-ramp strategy to bring applications to that. And that's not just uh, organic applications built for that hosting environment, but also inorganic apps that are caught off the shelf stuff, right? So, you know, how do we integrate those things that are already there, that are, you know, basically legacy, if you want to use that term, and written in languages that are probably no longer available <laughs> for the most part, right? Um, and allows us to use that at a data integration level, right? And that's where the whole fabric comes into play, right? And I, th I think also to address that, the common development that you're seeing in certain places, it's not everywhere yet, but down at Spay Wars, a good example, where Navy Canes, Marine Corps TSOA, and Army, I'm sorry, um, Air Force AOC have signed an MOA to do common development down at that system center in Charleston to, to develop this common enterprise services framework. And then also um, the, the next iteration will probably be around the PAS layer, which if you haven't talked to JR, who just walked in the room, this is Stacks would be. Um, that type of layer. So to take what this Stacks did, which was built on our OpenShift platform as a service, and then reuse that down across those tactical communities, Canes, Air Force AOC, and TSOA, uh, and then possibly even the JIE. So a common place to develop an app, if you write an app, it can run on a Navy uh, tactical uh, you know, data center in Canes, or it could run on a, a Navy data center part of the JIE network. And we focus some of that too with regard to developing application containers that it enables that portability of applications across these spaces. So the first question we'll put towards um, Mike, since you just took 10 minutes of time there. The, uh, it, no, <laughs> it's often mentioned that a COT SOA architecture can save the client money. Uh, can you expand on that? How, how is that? And can you expand a, a little bit on that? Sure. Um, it kind of relates to the gentleman's question over here to the right. Um, you know, our approach is all about, uh, with using a COTS-based package, is that we've, we've gone out, we've done a lot of studies out there, independent studies with our clients, and we've identified multiple things, right? We've identified everybody understands that if you, that if you basically lay down the foundation to create this common framework, you can start to see cost savings based on the fact that you have reusability of business services. There's Java jars and things out there. So if, if you have developers that are looking to engage a rules engine or a security component or some kind of document management piece, why do they need to write that business service from scratch when it's available in the architecture out of the box, right? We also found that it takes, a, we look, did a survey, 52% of our clients came back and told us it took them about 18 months to actually stand up a SOA architecture without even starting to configure, design, and test those business services, right? So we deploy in about four to six 
four to six weeks. Um, the ability to be able to interchange products, having those adapters readily available and business services that are compatible with that, right, so that you can do it. So our whole approach, in addition to that, is it basically reduces the amount of manpower that it takes to support, maintain, because it is a product that we sell. But also, when you look at it from a perspective of modernization or consolidation, which are synonymous to me, right, we – you, it, it basically uh, enables a very incremental approach, right? So instead of doing a rip and replace or designing new applications, what if you could start to decompose rules out of a uh, portfolio of applications and start to build, put them all into a centralized rules engine like BRMS, right? And then you start to build up a staff capacity that that's all they do is build rules out there. You really don't need to understand all the logic of the application as much as you just need to understand BRMS and be able to build out those rules. So now you end up with a stable of resources that can build rules on an ongoing basis. And what happens is many applications have the exact same rules in them over and over again. Things like in state government, it's what makes you a citizen of that state, right? That exists in almost every single application across government portfolio, right? What have you had that managed and maintained in one place? How much manpower would that allow you to, to be freed up? So that's kind of the strategy. And, you know, Accenture has other organizations that have tools that do things like automated data my, um, rules mining and things like that, right? But that's our approach is when we talk about consolidation, we talk about a very incremental approach, being able to take business functions, identify where you get the biggest return on investment from identifying where it's going to be reused over and over again the most, and be able to start to build out those resources in one spot, and then just point all the applications that you're looking to modernize towards it. Can you talk a little bit about the investment by both Accenture and Red Hat in that? Sure. As I said, Red Hat has been a very valuable partner to us. Um, most recently, you know, they have come to the table with the I'm sure many of you are already familiar with OpenShift, the OpenShift product that they have. I mean, OpenShift has enabled us to take our whole APS because could you imagine going out there and trying to demonstrate a solo architecture to a client? Yeah. Right? There's not much to demonstrate there. It's a bunch of slideware and everybody falls asleep. So basically, with OpenShift, we've been able to work with Red Hat. And this is not just for Accenture. I mean, this was for our clients because they we were sitting at the table trying to deal with this same challenge, right? So basically, by taking the OpenShift environment, which they allowed us to do, putting our APSP, our Accenture Public Service Platform, up into that cloud environment and that OpenShift environment, putting the BRMS rules engine up there, we were able to demonstrate to clients how the um, you could keep your data resident at home and safe and have this rules engine executing business rules up in a cloud, which really hit home. So it's been that type of operation, sitting down together and spending time together, trying to understand how do we help our clients to understand how they can start to realize some of these opportunities to do consolidation or modernization. Thank you, that's a great story. Uh, while, uh, how does Spin Systems leverage Red Hat's middleware solutions to collect and aggregate uh, military patient data spread across uh, disparate and geographically dispersed data sources? Sure. Um, like I mentioned, we started this project about uh, 2002, and the, the biggest hurdle that the Air Force, uh, our clients, uh, were having is you know, having all the silos of, uh, of data that's across the U.S. and overseas. And they wanted to have a way where they can collect data in near real time, collect that data, aggregate it, and bring it down on enter to an enterprise level. So they can act on it and build additional systems and subsystems and add to it. So after research, we decided to go with the, uh, the JBoss uh, application server as our cluster, you know, scalable solution as our middle tier. And in the field, we use the agent uh, framework uh, approach, where we build agents and all those uh, military bases, so they can remotely be administered and given, you know, commands on what to do. And uh, those agents, you know, running 24/7 collecting data. So I would say right now we collect anywhere between 1 billion to 1.2 billion records a day. So we bring all that data into the enterprise repository where you know, there's a cluster of JBoss uh, applications and also ESB uh, you know, tier right there for collecting all this magazine and, and you know, uh, 
aggregating and acting on it and, and applying it in, in business cases. Right? So this has been has been in place since O2 and has been fully die capped as well. You know, working with the airports and information assurance systems to get us where we are right now. How hard was that to do in 2002? It, it was very hard. The IA part. <laughs> J, J Boss, you could not find any stigs on it back then. I mean, if you went to this website, you couldn't lock it down, you couldn't stig it. So we had to actually physically sit down with the IA guys, walk them through the code, and show them how we had built all the different securities in place and how we locked down the code and how we were able to lock down the ports and how we're doing auditing and logging and all that stuff. So we had, it was a very painful process for all, all manual, but that's all history right now. So yeah. We're trying to make that easier every year too. Um, John, back to you. How do you, how do you leverage uh, BPM within a maritime tactical platform? Uh, well, um, so in, in talking of traditional BPM solutions, um, we're very much married along those lines, right? So what, what are we looking for in a BPM solution from our tactical mission computing environment? So anyone who knows what goes on within a mission computing environment, they're siloed, right? They're sp very specific systems that do very specific things and do one thing and one thing only and do it well, right? whether that's uh, ESM, whether that's ISR, whether that's radar. So all of those systems, however, in the past, could work very well that way, right? However, now, so you know, the middleware piece that comes in, but specifically with the uh, business process management piece is brought to that, there's a lot to do from a human resource perspective on board one of those wide body aircrafts. Just the am sheer amount of effort that those folks do and that are in our uniforms that are flying up there on a daily basis and the sheer amount of information that they are actually looking at and aggregating for them, right, for analysis purposes is astronomical. Um, so what we use that for is really to do work, workload reduction on board the aircraft, right? We look at business process automation across that space where it makes sense to apply those pieces to automated distribution of information you know, such as things like, for instance, simple things that used to go over voice commands across an HF radio set. You know, hey, I'm on station, D, I'm over here. Those are all things that the system knows where you are. It has nav data, it knows exactly what you're supposed to be doing. So that, that information there is already available to us to do. But then there's the more complex thing, like the complex event <coughs> processing pieces to that, right? Knowing how to pre-harvest data for what's coming up next in my mission cycle, right? So we're looking at those things as well. Thanks. Oh, Mike, back to you. Uh, can you provide some insight into Accenture's incremental approach to legacy application modernization and the role Red Hat and uh, the APSP play in that strategy? So I hit on it a little bit earlier. I mean, basically it is uh, being able to go in and take a look at a, a client's portfolio from a, from a holistic view, the entire portfolio. Um, be able to leverage some of the tools that we bring to the table, or like rules mining tools that will actually go through and sift through the applications, and also goes through and looks at where there's redundancies in applications from a functional perspective, right? So we have automated tools that do that already. And so we go in, we look at the, look at the entire portfolio, and then we help the customers to build out, um, you know, business services or, you know, stand up tools like, rules engines or document management systems and be able to set them up as centralized resources that can be shared. Um, when, we, when we go back to what we've done with, with Red Hat on this is that, again, we're doing a lot of work in the federal government as well as in overseas utilizing the Red Hat, Red Hat products. Um, so it's been a, uh, where we are right now is basically taking these products and putting them together pre-packaged, right, so that customers can go ahead and access them from a cloud service. So trying to adopt more of the strategy where in the community, uh, Accenture doesn't participate in the community. Let me, let me make that clear, okay? And we like to use Red Hat because we know that we have support behind the products. That, that's, we're pretty risk adverse. <laughs> So, um, but what we do like is the strategy of being able to put out the SOA architecture out there in the cloud environment so that developers can start to load that as part of their environment when they start and have access to the functional components that 
Red Hat offers so that from day one, when they're just doing some of their lab experimental work, they can start to see how it will come together um, in, in that environment. Thank you. While, uh, what considerations played a role in SPIN's decision to use open source for building the SOA-based healthcare platform? Well, um, I guess uh, the main reason we went with that, that approach is because our customer actually, the main requirements, they were looking for open standards, uh, flexible, scalable solutions, and above all, the ability to interconnect with other federal agencies. So after research, and you know, we decided to go with, with out of the box EDSP, the Enterprise Data Service or Platform, and with the SOA being the uh, the you know the main backbone for our our platform. And also, we used the uh, JBoss ESP because we figured after collecting all that wealth of information, and when we're able to put it in this enterprise layer. Um, the next requirement was, well, we need to you know, exchange that information with, with the outside world. You know, how are you able to do it? Um, so with the SOA approach and with all those different adapters that comes out of the box, we were able to immediately build uh, a new solution on top of this enterprise uh, called the PSR, personal health record. Uh, basically collecting and giving a 360 degree view to, of your medical record. So you collected all that data, how do you share it out to the actual patient? And the patient portal, it was a dot com, it wasn't even dot mil. So now we have another challenge. How do you take this military data from a dot mil to dot com? Um, again, leveraging the platform and the securities that, that comes out of the box, we were able you know, to use the SSL connections and the encryption uh, mechanism to encrypt all that data and share it through what we call the, uh, the health exchange, which we built at the back end. It's all ASP based. Uh, adapter based, and we were able to share that information with the dot com platform. So, as a military person, after you leave, you know, the service or if you retire, uh, most of the time you don't have access back to dot mil applications to look at your data. So now, being a member on the dot com uh, and this with this vendor that we went with, um, from anywhere in the world, you're able to log in and view your entire medical record. You know, using CCD uh, HL7 uh, approach. Uh, we were able, again, leveraging the, the SOA, we were able to build our adapter, which is uh, HL7 adapter. It was very easy. It, uh, it was uh, really, once you understand the standard, how it works, it's really for you, it was a lot easier for us just to adapt, adapt that standard and implement it as a part of our solution. With all those different data sources, how did you overcome the data integration? Well, that was probably one of the biggest hurdles we had because with the different silos, it, it, it became to us uh, a new challenge. Uh, each silo has its own vendor and its own native formats, so how do you get data? Um, again, after research, we were trying to find a, a, a mechanism to get to that data. And after some research, we find out that you know, with JBoss, TEED, or TAID, whatever, you can say there's different ways to say it. We were able to build a virtual data layer on top of all these different silos. And out of the box, you know, Teed came with a lot of heavy APIs, um, you know, and, and adapters. So we were able to, you know, directly connect to those silos and pull the data in the native format, bring it up into this virtual layer, you know, um, apply some business logic on it, and became, you know, make those objects available to various, you know, systems and applications. And therefore, you really just like, you know, knock down all the different barriers, you know, accessing different silos, especially if you have from different vendors with different formats. So John, uh, you're working on arguably the largest DoD program out there. What what are some of the pitfalls you have found with uh, with middleware solutions in general? So that's a great question. Uh, so there, pitfall wise, it's the traditional ones, the ones that you normally see when you when you start looking at the middleware space and start doing your trade space analysis across you know all the the product uh, uh, pieces there. Um, so you start looking at things like you know, how much infrastructure is this going to take up? How much real estate is this going to really take? So you start looking at that. And typically, you know, you start adding middleware components across an enterprise, you can go crazy, right? You can just start laying those out all over the place. And it doesn't make sense. So um, that's definitely one of the pitfalls that requires a lot of coordination and a lot of knowledge of, of not just your si individual system structures, but the interdependencies across those system structures. Uh, so, and then there's the, uh, um, how do I 
how do I deal with the dependency trade-off, right? So now I'm really just, there is a dependency trade-off there. I was dependent on, on OSs and you know, particular platform pieces, platform dependencies, and I just traded that to a middleware dependency, right? And what does that mean, right? So again, that's just something that you have to strategize about and take, take into account that you are making that dependency trade-off that, however, there are ways that you can mitigate that, specifically in the middleware environment through things like what the gentleman on the end was talking about, these out-of-the-box connectors that already exist that minimizes your, how much code you have to write, right? And how long it takes to get something stood up, right? So you, you, your ROI isn't immediate, however, you start seeing small things like, wow, look how fast I can integrate piece X to piece Y, right? Um, and look how fast I can start getting data to flow in those things. So, I mean, those are the two major pitfalls that we see. However, how we mitigate that is we do that through standard, right? Um, and we do that through uh, standard adoption by the middleware companies, particularly Red Hat, and that's why we love working with these folks, because the things that, that we're getting out of them is standard driven. They're, there's not a whole lot of middle, you know, Red Hat flavor to these things. It's open standards, open development of those standards in the open source community that translates into their enterprise base. So, good stuff. And this might be a question for, for all three of you. How did you, how did you overcome the, the, the enterprise, uh, you know, application integration, EAI, in each of those projects that you guys have worked on? And it, you can take that, John, or Al. So, uh, in basically, again, we reach back to standards and we start looking at best practices and, you know, what are those best practices within enterprise integration? And that starts with the enterprise integration patterns themselves, right? application of those enterprise patterns across your space ensures that you've modeled that behavior correctly and how you want your system to behave. And specifically across these complex environments that we deal with today, right? Uh, you know, the Navy, I remember when the Navy first came out with its net-centric kind of theme here was share everything, share all your data. And, you know, we as IT folks, we all sit there and go, all right, <laughs> that's not going to happen. However, if you can do that smartly, you can plan it, and you can start to uh, figure out what the what really needs to be met from a data requirement perspective, and ap apply those things to behaviors of your system. I mean, similar approach. I mean, <clears throat> we were presented with a, a few requirements by the Air Force to meet enterprise uh, integration, and <clears throat> again, leveraging the Red Hat uh, platforms, especially the Teed, we were able to hit every one of them. You know, uh, how do you actually plan for security? How you're able to open up, you know, adapters? Uh, what are the web services need to be in place? And basically all the rules and regulations, you know, we were able to uh, custom all that into our business logic as well. So it was it was a big hit for us, really, you know, especially when we came down to the, the full integration with all the different, you know, uh, parties that outside the Air Force where we were. And uh, like I said, there was a whole slew of things that we had to meet in order to meet all the enterprise uh, integration pieces, and we were all met with the help, you know, with, with the product. Mike? Yeah. So our approach, you know, um, I would say the uh, the whole thing that actually, uh, you know, got us started about thinking about uh, creating an out of the box SOA platform was, you know, to move away from a custom approach to a SOA implementation, right? And we did that for the reasons I said before. It's about 50% cheaper. Um, the other thing is, is the adapters come with it, the business services are there already, not customized to the adapters. Because, you know, today we're talking about Red Hat, yesterday we were talking about Oracle, whatever, right? The ability to basically that there's this layer of abstraction already built in the architecture between the business service and the functional component, a rules engine, uh, a workflow engine, whatever that is, right? There's this abstraction layer between there so that tomorrow you can go ahead and you can connect the next product that you want, or you can consolidate organiza organizations within your agencies that already own product that you want to have collaborate in the same environment because you're going through consolidation, right? To be able to do that in an out-of-the-box manner without trying to build that again, right? We do have, from time to time, have to build custom adapters, but we do have... Um, you know, our architecture is very conducive to doing um, integration to external applications. So it's just a different approach. Um, and we think that we believed from an Accenture perspective, instead of 
what we found is we were out there doing these projects and we were looking and basically counting for the time that it took us to build the SOA architecture over and over and over again. And that's why we moved to an out of the box strategy. Thank you. Is, I think we're getting close on five minutes, right? So is, are there any questions uh, from the crowd? I wanted a little bit of time for, for Q&A here and then I'll probably wrap up with one final question. Anybody? Well, um, so my geographic territory, I have the western region, right? So if you basically took a line straight north from Texas and went all the way across to the Pacific, that's that's my territory, okay? Um, it's not a closed architecture. Everything that we provide in the architecture is Java-based. So what we're, there's no closed component to APSP at all. What we give you is all these Java jars, right, that are basically there for you to use so that you can take those business services or you can take that abstraction and you can basically embed that and use it into your own applications to, to help them collaborate with the out-of-the-box turnkey COTS SOA platform. Is it, that, that was your, those were your questions, right? Anyone else? Okay. A final question for the panel and uh, this can even get extended to the crowd. Uh, what technologies and investment areas, and this is a broad question, uh, would you like to see companies like Red Hat invest more in in this market space? Um, and this can be a, something you see in the open source community that hasn't, you know, maybe is just starting, maybe gets enterprise features in the in the long long tail. Uh, it, it can, <laughs> the answer can be can be a, a wide array. It can be a, a more mature area too that you just want to see Red Hat do more investment in. So we'll start, uh, Mike, I think you're ready to go. Yeah, I would like to see you guys go uh, and develop a good master data management product for identity management. Everything we're doing in government is who's the person, you know, what's the truth, right? Who is this and who isn't it? I mean, what's the right version of the truth? I mean, I'm sure all you folks deal with that at, at, in, your, in your own operations. So that would be top of my list. Okay. Wow. Well, I guess if you asked me this a couple of years ago, it would have been like the, uh, the cloud computing. Um, you know, everybody going to cloud. Uh, we wanted to be one of the uh, early adapters to cloud technologies and products. So now, just you know, I think last year I started to hear about OpenShift. So I think we're going to start uh, maybe investing more time to fully understand how this OpenShift works. And you know, ideally we're looking for end-to-end -end solutions, not just you know, a, a pass sort of, sort of solution. We're looking for everything turnkey. From the hosting, from the uh, you know the pass, the SaaS, the whole nine. So it's like one place that does it all. Rather than you know, sometimes we go to Microsoft, sometimes we go to Azure, sometimes Akamai. Uh, we're spread uh, everywhere. So just to make our you know, life easy, <laughs> it'd be good from Red Hat to have some a product like this or okay. a full solution. John, uh, I'm uh, yeah, I'm not sure if this uh, if this actually translates to the conversation here in terms of middleware and DPM, but. Uh, I, I can tell you the things that, that plague my mind right at the moment as I start, because I'm always thinking three to five years out, where, where is this, where is my job going to have to be focused on three years from now? And what I start looking at today is, you know, it's a, it's a well-abused term, it's all over TV now, uh, you know, big data analytics, you know. How can I start looking at all this stuff that's being collected and confined in unstructured environments, right, within the IT community um, and start looking at how am I going to use that? How am I going to make that work for me? Right? So that brings a slew of technologies and a slew of new tools that have to be integrated into our complex environments. Right? And those tools go from predictive analytics uh, all the way down to things like complex event processors right? um, and OLAP uh, integration into things. And you, you mentioned the term OLAP to some of these program managers out there and they go, oh, who? <laughs> Right, because I mean, it's just not a, an industry term within their industry space, right? But now it is, as you start to start to look at uh, what's being done within these uh, ground-based collection and dissemination environments, right, in, in the cloud, if you call it the tactical cloud, you're going to have to start do, doing your own query management. You're going to have to start doing your own structured lookups because those structures just don't exist down there, and nor should they, right? 
things. So yeah, with cloud computing and big data and and all even mobile technologies, it's a it's a good time to be in technology. It's a good time to be a customer. You guys are getting ready to choose the next generation of vendors. So um, I want to pre I want to thank you all for for coming to the panel and uh, thanks for attending the session. I think we're wrapped up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.